All right, so this is the uh, visually, uh, di Visual Diagnosis Challenges Part 1. There are four cases. I'll read through the cases, and then this could be a really painful lecture for me and you if you don't respond, if you don't answer questions, if you don't engage with me, because I'm more like a facilitator for this part because I'm going to be crowdsourcing the wisdom of the room to try to get some of the answers to these questions. And, you know, there's not a specific um, right way to work it up because, you know, somebody comes in undifferentiated. You might have more experience in some areas than others, and you might want to get this test or that test. We're just looking for, okay, how would you guys do it, right? What would you do facing that clinical dilemma? And then we'll narrow down to the actual diagnosis and give you some management. So the first case is a 30-year-old previously healthy male who presents to an urgent care clinic. And that's great. We have urgent care clinicians right there, right? You're urgent care. So, oh yeah, no, that, now that you're walking out. No, we need you. We need you here now because you understand what happens at the urgent care clinic. Um, several days of fatigue. Oh, the bright lights. It hurts. It hurts. So he's got some photophobia. Notice some painful ulcers, some cankers or ulcers in his mouth and on his genitals. Well, that'll get him into the urgent care clinic quick, won't it? Ooh, you know. Um, do you guys have poison ivy in your area? We have poison ivy, right? And when, the, um, when, when they come in and they say they've got a rash and they're showing me on the hand, and if it's a male, I usually go, anywhere else? Because men tend to scratch and transfer the poison ivy around. Um, so uh, genital lesions, um, they're painful. Um, uh, he denies any medical uh, history uh, of uh, chronic conditions. Uh, he has no known drug allergies. He's not taking any medication, so there's not a medication eruption. Uh, he denies alcohol and drug use, for what that's worth, because, okay. Um, his visual acuity, which is tested, great, and it is found to be normal. Uh, but he does have uh, bilateral photophobia. So we've got three images there, one of the eye, one of the mouth, and one of the lesions, and there's multiple lesions on the um, scrotum. So the first question is, you're, you're gonna do a good history, followed by a directed physical exam, followed by appropriate and judicious use of investigations to confirm your ruling in or ruling out things. So what other questions do you have for this young man, this 30-year-old, who's come in with the eye, the mouth, and the genital lesions. This is where I open it up to the floor and hopefully let's go fast. Okay, what do you got? What do you want to know? You're going to have to speak up really loud. Sexual activity, sexual activity. absolutely. You want, a, you want a sexual history, right? Okay, he denies being sexually active. Now, we've seen people who, could you be pregnant? No, I couldn't be pregnant, right? And 5% of those people who say absolutely not are. Right? So, so but, but that's a really great question because uh, STIs, you know, it's in the back. This is on my differential, right? Okay, anything else? Fever, he does not have a fever, okay? And of course, during, during COVID times, you may not think this, but travel history, right? Has he been somewhere? Do I have to think of exotic things that I don't know about, right? Somebody said something over here, was it you? Can he climb a tree? Interesting. Could you explain why you'd ask him about climbing a tree? Because I don't know. What? Oh. And what's that mean? Can't pee. Can't climb a tree. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I don't know that little... Um, maybe that's a U.S. thing. I'm not familiar with the can't climb a tree, can't pee. Okay. That's writers, so that's on your differential. I know what that is, at least. But, yeah, but I didn't know that was the little mnemonic or the little saying for it. Okay, um, so we, we talked about um, sexual history, travel history, family history, you know? You know, is this, is this, anybody else have something like this? Have you ever had this before? Okay, nothing. You get nothing. All right, so you have pictures, and the, oh, they're in color, good. And so who here wants to play the ophthalmologist because it's a night, weekend, or holiday, 
and uh, tell me what they see on that picture. So let's describe that. What do you see on that picture? Oh, you could start with red eye. I mean, we could start really easy, right? It looks red, doesn't it? Inflamed. A limbic flush. Now, you can't do this, but I can do it on my iPad, right? I can go like this. And you see that little white meniscus-like thing of pussy white blood cells there, right? Inside that anterior chamber, okay? And all that iritis, uveitis sort of look to everything on the conjunctival area coming in. So what can cause that kind of eye finding? Oh, you know, right? What Sexually transmitted diseases, right? So, inf look, hey, we could back up and say infections, right? And under infections, you can have STIs, right? There are other infections that can cause that that I don't see very often. I don't know about you, but leprosy and <laughs> tuberculosis. I don't see much tuberculosis where I work, but leprosy and tuberculosis, syphilis as the STI. How about anything that's non-infectious? Autoimmune diseases, yep, they can do this, where you start attacking your own eyeballs. Yep, collagen vascular disease, reactive arthritis like you were talking about, Bichette's um, disease, those types of things. I would have also asked about um, chemical exposures and occupational stuff, because uh, I work in a farming community and there's lots of different chemicals that they work with, and they don't always wear proper protection on their hands and their eyes and stuff. And so what are they working with and what animals are they working with as well? So because I work in a rural community, I'm asking additional questions in that area, right? Because, pardon me? Yeah. So the oral lesions, what do they look like? This is an easy question. I'll say it's easy and nobody will get it, right? But it's an easy question. What, what are those oral? What are they... Yeah, which is Greek for ulcer, ulcer, right? Because that's, you know, that means in Greece. Greek, sorry, but it's all Greek to me. Ulcer, ulcer. Yeah, so these are the little ulcers in the mouth, right? What can cause those ulcers in the mouth? You're getting a prize. I've got extra prizes today, but I'm not allowed to throw them from the stage. I could hurt someone. We don't have insurance for that. Trauma? Okay, sure. I, I thought you were going to go with sexually transmitted infection, but okay. You just don't want to get in a rut, do you? No, okay. Um, yeah, so trauma, okay. What else? Inf oh, thank you. Wow, she's, she's like top of the class now. You, you should move up one road and join this woman over here, right? Um, yeah, so um, infections, and you know, we, we see these with what? Epstein-Barr, right? Herpes simplex. We'll see these, you know, little ulcers like that. Um, there are a bunch of other... Um, diseases that can cause this. Um, when I see oral lesions and eye lesions or eye findings, I think of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and the extra manifestations or the extra GI manifestations that you can get because we know that Crohn's can go anywhere from the lips to the bottom end, from top to bottom, but they also can get some eye findings like iritis and uh, uveitis. And so if they came in with lesions like this and he's in his 30s, right? So, you know, I'm thinking... Okay, there's that, that early, you know, 20 to 30 age that gets inflammatory bowel disease and that second bump around age 50. So he's in that demographic area. So I'd be uh, thinking about that. Um, he denied uh, medications, but uh, certainly drug reactions can cause that on the oral mucosa like that. Erythema multiforme can cause that, bolus femphigoid, those types of things. Okay, now the genital lesions. What do you think? Sexually transmitted disease, oh yes. And which one? Herpes, okay, yeah. Because multiple and painful. Because if it's a solitary one and painless, that's syphilis usually, right? They get that cancoid or cancoid or whatever it's called. So, so you get the one, but it doesn't hurt, right? But he's got multiple and they're painful. Drug eruptions again, Steven Johnson syndrome, Crohn's disease, Bichette's disease, those types of things can also do that as well. So, let's get to the workup stage. Who wants to order some tests? Well, unless I you know, have to put them in myself into the EMR. Um, so, uh, what would you want? 
you know, you're, we're going to get the STI panel stuffy, right? We're, we're not, yeah, we're good. Anything else you want? Look into this. Any basic blood work that you would like to get? Inflammatory markers, like would you get a CRP, an ESR, if you still do ESRs, CRPs, those types of things. Um, there was a suggestion in the notes about maybe getting um, eosinophils, uh, looking for those, um, just because it could be some kind of allergic, you know, here, here, and here. Um, the next question is uh, two possible diagnoses. Not what is it, but you know, and we'll give the first one and oh, this could be an infectious cause, specifically a sexually transmitted infection, either syphilis or uh, herpes, um, and then uh, an inflammatory condition, okay? And that could be an autoimmune disease, that could be Crohn's disease, that could be Bichette's disease, those types of things. So here's the money question. What do you think this gentleman has? Since it's the first case, I'm going to tell you it's Bichette's. And then I'll tell you what Bichette's is like. Because they say this can often be missed in the emergency department. Yeah. Right? If I saw this person, I don't know if I'd be thinking Bichette's right off the bat. I do a lot of reading. I do, you know, stay up on the literature. But I may not put it together, those three findings. But they say it's easily missed. I would say, I don't know if you guys would miss it. And I don't think I would miss it. I just wouldn't know maybe it's Bichette's. I would get the good history followed by the directed physical exam and do appropriate investigations. And then at the end, I might be scratching my head going, I'm not sure. And I'd be reaching out for a friend, right? Call a colleague, i.e. get a consult and say, I'm concerned about these eye findings. Maybe I'd call ophthalmology, right? I'm concerned about these uh, skin findings. I'm concerned about infectious diseases. So maybe I'd call ID, you know, but this person isn't going to go, yeah, I don't know what it is. Here's some steroid cream. Right? Like, that's not what's going to happen. So I don't think that I would let this slip through the cracks if I've got someone in here, you know, that comes in with an eye that looks like that, a bunch of sores in their mouth, and a whole bunch of painful lesions on their groin. And I don't think they'd be satisfied leaving going, yeah, the doctor really didn't know what it was. Right? So I don't think it would get missed. But I may not nail down, oh, yes, of course, that's Bichette's. Right? Um, but they tend to get genital uh, ulcers, oral ulcers, uveitis, they talk about it being missed. There's some demographics that are involved, so it's more likely to be seen in men, of course, with the uh, scrotal lesions, but, um, and men from the Middle and Far East. Didn't know that. Um, and they can get other manifestations of this with regards to, you know, pustular vasculitis. Um, they can get loss of vision, right? So I think that would be a, geez, I don't think we're sending that person home. That's an easy consult to ophthalmology. I've got a person coming in, they're young and healthy, and now they've got bilateral red eyes and are only finger counting. You know, that, that could be like, oh, I think that's reasonable, not I'll see them in the office tomorrow, right? So um, you can get uh, visual loss from that. Now for treatments, is anybody here a Bichette's expert? Because there's usually some expertise in the crowd. Anybody a Bichette's expert? Okay, good. So you're, we're all on the same playing field, like with me, when I was reading up on this. What do you treat this with? Well, there really isn't much treatment for it. I mean, you can give some oral tetracaine, you can give some, you know, things to soothe the eyes, but really it's a matter of referring to ophthalmology, you know, because the blindness is the, is the thing that you want to avoid, and they would be managing um, these eye findings and perhaps a rheumatologist as well. Bichette's. Okay. wonder if you'll remember that when it comes across. Eyes, mouth, genital. Multiple lesions, painful. 30-year-old man. Maybe if they had said he was from the Middle East or something like that, maybe that would have triggered something. Okay. Number two. This is a 35-year-old male who comes to the emergency department. Painful lesions on the fingertips. They're intermittent. The pain has been going on and off in the digits for months. He's never had this before, outside of the months that it's been going on. But prior to that, he was well. He denies any trauma to the fingers. No past medical history. He's not on any chronic medications. He doesn't have any family history of his fingertips going black like this. And you take a social history. You know, he drinks socially. He smokes cigarettes, and his hands are shown, as per that picture, 
with the fingertips, looks like the tips of them are sloughing off and they're black. They're warm, but they're very tender to the touch. So what else do you want to know in taking a good history on this gentleman who's in his mid-30s with painful fingers on and off for months? And if you say sexually, you know, I'm, no. Okay, fine. I'm just going to stand like this. Oh, yes, you in the... Fr yeah, so I'd be like looking at occupational, like some kind of contact, right? Both hands working with some kind of chemical, a dye, an acid, a, or cold temperatures, right? This, you know, you can get fooled by frostbite that shows up later, right? You know, so is he working with, you know, uh, you know cold meat packing, something that, you know, not wearing appropriate gloves and a contact. That's great. Yeah, that's what I would be thinking, a work history. All right. How would you describe these fingertips? Necrotic. I heard necrotic. You sort of have to speak loudly up here. So, yeah, yeah. They look necrotic to me. Yeah, and it's and it's the tips, right? All right. What tests do you want to do for this gentleman? I'd get some basic blood work. Maybe get some inflammatory markers, right? Maybe get some STI testing. Um, what do you think this is? What do you say? Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what people um, would be very reasonable to consider Raynaud's. He, you know, where, where they go the pallor, the pain, then they get all red, right, and afterwards. This isn't Raynaud's, but that's what I would think too. When I was looking at this, that's, that's the first thing I would come up with and go, hey, I wonder if this is Raynaud's, right? Burgers, yeah, and that's what this is, right? Yeah, and the smoking, yeah, you got it, sir. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and they get thrombo angiitis obliterans, tau, T-A-O, tau. And it's usually, you know, your, your top two differentials are exactly that, right? Raynaud's plus uh, burgers. Um, and it's linked to smoking, so it's associated with smoking. Obviously, we don't have a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled crossover trial saying, okay, you guys smoke for this length of time, and you guys don't smoke for this length of time, and let's see what happens to your fingers, right? So it's associated with that. And not just uh, smoking, but also chewing tobacco, too. So don't go, well, he doesn't smoke cigarettes. He's just a chewer, right? He just puts a pocket in there and spits, right? It can still be burgers with that. Usually younger men, you know, 20, 30-year-olds, that kind of stuff. And uh, they get the pain in the tips of their uh, uh, fingers and toes, and often thought of Raynaud's. Um, but again, that's more common in women. Doesn't mean that they can't get it. So um, what causes this is that they get this vascular uh, uh, bed that pinches off, and you get necrosis of the distal tips. That's it. Now, we don't know why, right? Nobody has a, I, I know how this happens. Or as they say, it's idiopathic, right? Even the idiots can't figure out the pathology. And no, they're not idiots. Of course, they're not. But, um, but you, you, we don't know, right? It's unknown, actual, the pathophysiology. Uh, for the cause, we know that it's the vascular beds pinching off on those distal uh, extremities. Anybody uh, want to guess at the treatment for this uh, smoker? <laughs> Whoa. Top of the class again. Yeah, no. Um, and that would be a good uh, advice for anyone who came in with a twisted ankle and who was a smoker, right? And there's data that says, you know, have you thought about quitting smoking? You know, just little nudges in the primary care literature, little nudges can make a difference. So even if it wasn't for this thing, encouraging um, smoking sensation is always a good plan. And so uh, that's one of the ways to do it, stopping smoking. Now, anticoagulants have been tried. Oh, you know, the vas you know, vaso, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. Now, I don't know if they've gone into DOACs, but other uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs, those types of things have never been shown to help with this. Um, people have tried infusions of prostaglandins, uh, those types of things. Again, not helpful. And then you're going to have to deal with those fingertips. And by you, I mean call a surgeon, right? And take a look and see if they not just need to be debrided, but sometimes they need to be amputated as well. So uh, the disposition for this uh, gentleman would be um, consult surgery, okay? You know, consult surgery. And, uh, and then maybe a rheumatological follow-up, I don't know. But certainly the acute thing in the emergency department would be to reach out to your surgical colleagues. 
Case number three, a 23-year-old male presents to your ED with painful lesions on his ear. It's been there for the last few days. Denies any trauma, no past medical history, no family history, no autoimmune disease, takes no prescription medications, and he's not sexually active. I just threw that in. That's not in your text. Okay, so what else do you want to know on a history from this person who has this black ear? Exposures, yeah. You know, like, did you fall asleep on a metal pole? Right? You know, did you pass out? Right? Were you drinking and passed out? I, that, you know, because it's only on one side, right? So that could happen, right? So were you outside and freezing? That's the first thing we had in here. Yeah, anything else? Smoking history? Is that what you're going to say? He smokes a little weed. I don't know what you mean by a little weed, so I always get them to quantify. What do you mean by a little weed? How many times have you been treated for hyperemesis cannabis? But yeah, a little weed, right? <laughs> Any what, sorry? Oh yeah, yeah, so, so it could be some kind of infectious process or, or metal or something that there's an allergic reaction happening there. Is that what you're getting at? Because people can have some kind of contact that causes that. Yep, absolutely. Um, anything else? He drinks a little beer. And again, I usually quantify that. What do you mean by a little beer? Because, you, know, you know, some people will say, well, you know, I have a couple on the weekend. And other people say, well, you know, I don't drink a lot, just 12 every night. Now, that would be a lot to me. So quantifying. No, he just has a couple of beers with friends on the weekend. And he also does cocaine with friends. And that's the key to this. So how would you describe that ear? Does that look like those fingertips? Because if you describe that ear like those fingertips, you are correct. It's black and necrotic looking. So what's wrong with this patient? I don't see a lot of cocaine. We, we see a lot more alcohol misuse and, um, and meth um, in our area. So we don't, we don't have a big cocaine community. So this, this is a pseudovasculitis. It's a pseudovasculitis. You know, it looks like, you know, a vasculitis where the blood vessels pinched off and it got all necrotic, but cocaine can cause this pseudovasculitis. Um, and it's not the cocaine, actually. It's what they cut the cocaine with. Oh, you know this. You have experience with cocaine, do you? Can you, can you do this with your... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so we get... With fentanyl, okay. Yeah, so it's not the fentanyl that does this, but what they do is they cut it with an, uh, an anti-worming agent, an anti-hemolynthic um, drug called levomisole. Levomasol, am I saying that correctly? Depends where you put your emphasis, right? But uh, they cut it with this because it's a very similar looking, and this is what causes the pseudovasculitis is because it looks like cocaine. They cut the cocaine with that for when they're distributing it. And it can cause that whether you inhale it uh, nasally or, sorry, nasal or inhale it. Um, it's an inexpensive drug that looks like cocaine that can be cut uh, for the cocaine and causes these lesions on the ears and the cheeks, typically. Um, there's no test for this. I mean, you can do a urine drug test, I guess, looking for cocaine and stuff if the person is saying they didn't do any drugs. And you could run a, a panel on that. But there's no specific tests. You know, uh, CBC doesn't tell you that but you could get CBC and inflammatory markers to look for infectious issues that could be secondary to the necrotic tissue there. But the uh, key to this is a surgical consult. And, uh, and often it can be quite disfiguring, right, if you have to remove that part of the lobe. All right, last case. 57-year-old female, urgent care clinic. She's not looking at me. Oh, okay, good, yeah. Okay, urgent care. Um, uh, stuffy nose for two days, gradual onset of headaches. She admits to picking her nose. The 10 most common causes for epistaxis is digital trauma. Um, she's, got hypertensive, she's got hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, and she's recovering from COVID, and that's the key in there. She's recovering from COVID. She's a little feverish. Her vision seems a little blurry. She's not on any medications now. She doesn't smoke or drink, but her heart rate is up at 105, and she does have a fever. So, you look and you see in her mouth that. Wow. What do you think? What is that? It's pretty 
horrific looking if I looked into somebody's mouth and saw that kind of stuff back there. Um, yep, she's diabetic. Yep. So uh, what else on, uh, would you like to uh, look for on examination? What would you do with someone where you just looked in their mouth and went, ooh, I better do a little bit more thorough examination here. You know, I'd be doing more extensive neuro exam, right? Doing a more extensive neuro exam, looking at the eye, right? Doing a better eye exam for this, getting out your nasal speculum and looking up the nose. What tests do you want to get? This is the uh, emergency medicine alphabet test, by the way. A, B, C, T. Right, that's the, you know, like, what, what do we need? A, B, C, T. That's right. So that's the, we'd get a CT of the head and face um, for that. Now, you would get, you know, some basic blood work as well, CBC, inflammatory markers, those types of things. Um, she does have a low-grade fever and, you know, SERS criteria, right? Heart rate greater than 90. So you'd be getting, you know, maybe a lactate level, um, getting blood cultures off this individual and doing your sepsis panel, right? Because I think this would put in most EMRs a whoop, whoop, whoop. Somebody coming in with a fever, tachycardic, and has this lesion in their mouth. All right, so does anybody know what this is? I didn't know what this was until this lecture, so don't like go, hey, how is he so smart, right? I'm not. I had to look this up as well. This is, this is the um, uh, mucomycosis, uh, the black fungus, and it's been associated with COVID, and there was a big outbreak in India when uh, COVID was uh, ravaging through their country and uh, there was uh, cases of this CAM or COVID-associated mucomycosis, the black fungus. Um, and peoples with, uh, people with immune system problems uh, can be more susceptible, so that's why it was in the case that she had diabetes, you know, so her sugar might be up, maybe a little immunosuppressed, a little bit more susceptible to that. Um, it usually attacks uh, the sinus area, uh, can cause headaches, fever, double vision, can eat through that thin little bone there and go right upstairs, right? So CT of the head looking for a fungus ball. Um, yeah, it's, it's not good. This requires an urgent consultation to a head and neck surgeon. Um, surgery is usually required. Yeah, you start them on IV um, amphotericin uh, and uh, the prognosis is Poor, yeah, poor. So, um, and, and this is the case that you can get in an urgent care clinic or in fast track, right? You know, somebody comes in, you know, yeah, I had COVID a couple of weeks ago, I'm getting better. You know, general population, maybe hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and you know, I got stuffy nose and a low grade fever. And you look in the mouth and go, yeah, I just think it's strep throat. No, if you see some black stuff back there, right, start thinking maybe this is COVID associated um, muco. Uh, Cytosis.